Good morning and welcome to this week's Grow, where we gather to recharge, organize, and work here as members of MWEG. We are so glad that you're joining us today. We have been doing our Simply Connect um, this summer, and we hope that you've been following along with us. As part of that, we um, are going to talk today about diversity in journalism and how we can connect with our um, communities and media. And we have Alexa Datsun here. She is an MWAG intern that is working with our media literacy group. And she also joined us on a youth panel at our spring conference this year. And we're, um, she's recently done uh, a course or a program with the New York Times, School of the New York Times in New York City. And she um, has, has been working and doing some journalism stuff with them. She recently graduated high school and is going to be moving on to um, the University of Southern California. So good for her, we're so happy for her. And I just wanna tell you a little bit about her. She is has done a lot already for her community. She's co-founder of We The Future. And she has also been working with, um, is it Girls Run? Or, oh, you're muted. Here we go. Oh, there you uh, are. Yeah, I went to Girl State. Um, I have done a little bit of work um, with Utah Women as well. So, yeah. And Girls Lobby, is that what yeah. I remember? Yeah, Girls Lobby. And then also, you have worked to expand youth involvement in civics. And I think that that's great because that is something we really you know, the next generation, a lot of your friends, yourself included, have just have just reached that age um, to vote, but there's still, you know, a lot of these laws that are being voted on in, in Congress and, and in the Senate are going to affect your generation as they, as they start to roll through. So it's great that you're keeping an eye on that and that you're involved um, in, in politics in that way. She's also involved in her community and she is a beekeeper and so she's been helping to create pollinator spaces for bees in kind of an in, do you do it in the urban communities or or further out and how do you do that yeah mostly just within my city so I live in Vineyard um, in Utah County um, and yeah something that I've done like via my work on youth council is create um, pollinator boxes within our community garden um, to sort of be more inviting um, to the pollinators so that way we can like help support their populations, but then also support the gardens of um, the community members, um, just because like having pollinators will be so helpful for helping their um, plants grow better. So yeah, it's kind that, of- That's great. So all, the, all of you Utah County gardeners, especially those in Vineyard can thank Alexa for having healthy gardens that are producing great fruits and vegetables as the, her pollinators are helping and, and they're doing that. She has been on her town youth council and she was a recipient of the president's volunteer service award in 2021. So that little introduction um, can give you an idea of how great Alexa is. And we are so glad to have her as an intern here at MWEG. And we are so glad to have her do some media literacy with us today on diversity and journalism. So with that, I'm gonna turn the time over to Alexa. And also if you're joining us, please feel free to ask questions. Just you can um, unmute yourself and ask some questions. So, or put some, or if you have comments, you can put those in the chat. So go ahead. Perfect. Okay, um, I'm really excited. Yeah, so today, Today we're going to talk about diversity in journalism and how we can use journalism to amplify underrepresented voices. Um, yeah, so we'll start with an introduction, just a little bit about me to sort of contextualize this whole thing. Um, and then we'll look at identity and how one's identity can impact um, the sort of voice they have or ability they have to tell a certain story. Um, and then we're going to talk about a single story, um, a limiting sort of perspective, and what we can do to challenge those stories. Um, and then we'll wrap it up with a little um, sort of how to or like my um, 
like tips or best practices um, for using journalism to amplify your own voice and the voices of those who are underrepresented in your community. Um, yeah, so an introduction, a little bit about me. Um, yeah, as stated, my name is Alexa Dadson. I'm 17. Um, I'm an MWEG media literacy intern. Um, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I was born and raised in Utah County. Um, my parents are immigrants from West Africa. Um, so there's like a lot of different like components sort of impacting my identity. Oh, and then also mentioned I am going to be starting university in the fall. Um, I'll be studying philosophy, politics, and law at the University of Southern California. Um, and then to sort of explain like why I'm even here or like what qualifies me to be giving this presentation, um, I attended the School of the New York Times a few weeks ago. Um, the School of the New York Times is basically a summer program for high schoolers um, to learn a little bit more about journalism. So I spent two weeks in New York City um, taking a course called Diverse Voices in Reporting, um, and we really got to do a deep dive into um, sort of the issues with diversity in media and what we can do to combat that. So yeah, now let's look at identity. Um, I feel like this is a really important part of sort of informing or of what informs your perspective as a journalist. So um, yeah, let's talk about intersectionality and let's talk about um, how your identity can impact the way that you write. Um, I guess just like a first question, um, what does diversity look like? Or how do you know when you're in a space that is diverse? Um, for those of you that are in the meeting with me, um, do you guys have any thoughts on this? Well, my, my first thing is it's gonna be something that's different than what I'm used to, right? And so it would be diverse, like diverse for my community would have like more multi multicultural experiences um, or, and it's going to uh, have more races represented, which may not be the case all the time where I live. So for me, that's what diversity would look like, cultures and race that are represented better. Yeah, I definitely agree. It's just about like bringing in more voices that you haven't necessarily seen before. Um, yeah, I think sometimes it's hard to know if a space is diverse or not or diverse enough. Um, so I think that definitely is like deserving of like analysis and sort of just like your own personal thoughts. Like, what do you feel like a diverse space looks like and how can you diversify the spaces that you're already in? Um, for me, I look at diversity a lot as like a numbers game. On this next slide, I have um, some statistics about journalism and diversity in journalism. Um, so as we can see, there's like a lot of different aspects of diversity. We can look at gender, age, sexual orientation, political ideology, um, socioeconomic status, and then like race and ethnicity, um, and so many other different factors that just like um, bring different perspectives to a conversation. Um, in this study, it was found that um, most journalists felt that their news organizations were more diverse in terms of gender and age than they were in terms of race and socioeconomic status. Um, so I think that's definitely interesting. Um, and I also think it's definitely important to consider um, those like less mentioned aspects of diversity. I think especially age is something that's not like very often talked about. Um, so we see a lot of spaces in which we have a lot of people that are like in the sort of same age group or same generation, um, but it can be really valuable to bring in younger voices, older voices, um, and have, I think, just like a broader discussion. So, um, yeah, so intersectionality, this is sort of like, um, this is like an academic theory, sort of an analysis on the different aspects of identity and how that impacts power, how that impacts privilege, how that impacts um, disadvantage. 
So um, sort of similar to that last slide, we see like all of these different ways in which someone can um, be diverse, um, race, ethnicity, class, language, like there's so many different things. Um, I would also include location. I feel like that um, we can bring in people from different locations or um, the location from which you're reporting is gonna impact the story that you're telling. Um, yeah, so I think as um, a journalist, um, for me, a journalist in training or just someone that's interested in telling a story about their community, um, it's really important to look at yourself um, and look at like where you fit within all of these circles. Where is your Venn diagram? Um, because that is going to have a really large impact on what your what experiences you're best able to speak to um, and what stories you're going to be most like well equipped to tell. Um, yeah, so how does identity affect journalism? Um, as a writer, um, I feel like the way that it progresses is sort of um, your identity, a lot of which is going to be kind of decided for you before you come into this world, your race, your ethnicity, um, age, which obviously changes over time, um, the language that you speak as a first language, languages that you learn later, and sort of just like that amalgamation of um, traits um, is sort of going to form that identity. And as you go through life, um, that identity is going to impact your experience. Um, for example, like members of different socioeconomic classes are going to experience life um, really differently, or people that are from different countries, or people that are from different cultures, um, just like the things that they experience throughout life, whether it be the foods they eat or the languages they're exposed to, like that's all going to be impacted by your experience. Um, and then your experience is going to inform your perspective. So like all of those like ideas that you're being surrounded by because of your identity um, are sort of going to um, like deeply impact the way that you see the world, the way that you perceive other people. Um, and with that perspective, you have like this special lens through which you can view people's stories, um, the way that you can view your community um, and therefore tell those stories. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk about a single story. I have a little bit of a TED talk. We're gonna watch like the first five minutes of this TED talk. Um, let me know if you can hear the video. No. No. I'm a okay. Um, here, wait. Let me figure out how to show the sound with my. It started working. Oh, okay. We're good. Yeah. Um, I would like to tell you a few personal stories about what I like to call the danger of the single story. I grew up on a university campus in Eastern Nigeria. My mother says that I started reading at the age of two, although I think four is probably close to the truth. So I was an early reader, and what I read were British and American children's books. I was also an early writer. And when I began to write at about the age of seven, stories in pencil with crayon illustrations that my poor mother was obligated to read, I wrote exactly the kinds of stories I was reading. All my characters were white and blue eyed. They played in the snow. They ate apples. <clears throat> and they talked a lot about the weather, how lovely it was that the sun had come out. <laughs> now this, despite the fact that I lived in Nigeria, had never been outside Nigeria. We didn't have snow. We ate mangoes, and we never talked about the weather because there was no need to. My characters also drank a lot of ginger beer because the characters in the British books I read drank ginger beer. Never mind that I had no idea what ginger beer was. <laughs> and for many years afterwards, I would have a desperate desire to taste ginger beer. But that is another story. What this demonstrates, I think, is how impressionable and vulnerable we are 
in the face of a story, particularly as children. Because all I had read were books in which characters were foreign, I had become convinced that books by their very nature had to have foreigners in them and had to be about things with which I could not personally identify. Now things changed when I discovered African books. There weren't many of them available and they weren't quite as easy to find as the foreign books, but because of writers like Chinua Achebe and Kamara Lai, I went through a mental shift in my perception of literature. I realized that people like me, girls with skin the color of chocolate, whose kinky hair could not form ponytails, could also exist in literature. I started to write about things I recognized. Now, I loved those American and British books I read. They stirred my imagination, they opened up new worlds for me. But the unintended consequence was that I did not know that people like me could exist in literature. So what the discovery of African writers did for me was this, it saved me from having a single story of what books are. I come from a conventional middle-class Nigerian family. My father was a professor. My mother was an administrator. And so we had, as was the norm, living domestic help who would often come from nearby rural villages. So the year I turned eight, we got a new house boy. His name was Fide. The only thing my mother told us about him was that his family was very poor. My mother sent yams and rice and our old clothes to his family. And when I didn't finish my dinner, my mother would say, finish your food. Don't you know people like Fide's family have nothing? So I felt enormous pity for Fide's family. Then one Saturday, we went to his village to visit. And his mother showed us a beautifully patterned basket made of dyed raffia that his brother had made. I was startled. It had not occurred to me that anybody in his family could actually make something. All I had heard about them was how poor they were, so that it had become impossible for me to see them as anything else but poor. Their poverty was my single story of them. Years later, I thought about this when I left Nigeria to go to university in the United States. I was 19. My American roommate was shocked by me. She asked where I had learned to speak English so well and was confused when I said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. She asked if she could listen to what she called my tribal music and was consequently very disappointed when I produced my tape of Mariah Carey. She assumed that I did not know how to use a stove. What struck me was this, she had felt sorry for me even before she saw me. Her default position toward me as an African was a kind of patronizing, well-meaning My roommate had a single story of Africa, a single story of catastrophe. In this single story, there was no possibility of Africans being similar to her in any way, no possibility of feelings more complex than pity, no possibility of a connection as human equals. Okay, um, yeah, so that's just like the first little bit of this TED Talk, but I would recommend listening to the rest. It's really interesting for sure. Um, but this sort of gives us an introduction into what a single story is, what that looks like, and um, how that can sort of be um, oop, um, harmful or, well, I mean, yeah, I think in general, single stories are definitely like limiting. Um, so yeah, I guess we can sort of discuss um, what other single stories have you heard and um, why do you think they were compelling? Like what, why do you think that you have like bought into those single stories? Um, I think one example that I can think of, um, a lot of single stories, I think, exist in the form of stereotypes. Um, and one stereotype that I hear um, very often is like the stereotype that Asians or Asian Americans are like really good at math and they have like really strong family values um, and sort of just like this like um, framework, I think, that has been sort of imposed on the Asian and Asian American communities. Um, yeah, so also, that's like one yeah. example of a single story. I also think that often when we see homeless people um, or people you know, living 
living on the street that we automatically assume that um, the, the circumstances that brought them there were all of their own doing. And although that can be the case in some circumstances, we just don't know. We don't know what got them to that point in their life. And, um, you know, and so sometimes we feel like, well, you got yourself in this hard position. So I, you know, you're going to have to get yourself out of it. And, and we kind of harden ourselves to, and, and, and turn a blind eye because we don't want to help because we feel like that is their, their own unraveling. And I think that, you know, that that's something that is a, a misstep on our part if we go into it with that single story of this is why they're there this is how they got there that's it that's it you know not all people that are homeless are addicted to drugs or not all people that are homeless are uneducated necessarily or or whatever it may be um so that's just one that that strikes me um in in the communities yeah um yeah I definitely agree that's a single story that I've heard as well um and I think part of what makes single stories so harmful is that they give us like these simple reasons to sort of latch onto so that we don't have to do like further analysis to sort of see like the root of problems like that um like if the majority of people just believe that people that are like homeless or unhoused um is is because of their own doing or um yeah like sort of their own fault then that sort of gives us a reason not to think about like why is homelessness such a large issue um what can we do to use policy and media to combat this issue but instead we sort of just like assign the blame elsewhere but i also think that we go when we have that mentality of that that single story in our head that when we go into certain situations with that thought, that we are not open to finding, like hearing their stories. We're not opening, we're not opening ourselves up to, to the listening or the learning that can happen to be helpful, like you said, when it comes to policy changes or how can our communities help or what more could we do? Um, you know. Is this is this brought on because there's a housing crisis, or you know, they're they're being, or what whatever it may be. And I'm using just this as one example, obviously. But um, I think when we have these single stories in our head, and like you said, you know, about um, Asian students, like when you go into that, then you already have decided like this is what it is, and you're not opening yourself up to learning and being like, oh maybe they're interested in more things than math and science, or maybe there's more to their story right. than one thing, right? Exactly. It's not, yeah. it's not just education or it's not just homelessness or whatever, whatever it might be. Yeah, there's definitely always more to the story, but um, having a single story sort of um, removes the responsibility of having to think more about like um, why do these certain stereotypes exist why do these issues in society exist um, because we like have this like easy story to believe um, so we don't necessarily have to ask more questions um, I think another single story that like has existed and um, definitely is still impacting people is like the single stories that we've been told about women like historically um I don't know just like so many negative um like stereotypes or ideas have existed about women and what they're capable of and what they're able to do um and um I think part of why single stories such as this and the other ones that we've discussed why they exist and why they persist is because um, they often like serve people that are in power. So um, if we have um, sort of like um, like the ruling class or like the people that are um, in charge at a certain moment in history um, and there's like a certain idea that they want to preserve, um, then telling that single story can preserve that power. Oh, I think another really good example of this um, is the current narratives that we have about immigration from the southern border. Um, there's a lot of ideas that like a lot of immigrants are 
carrying drugs or they're all criminals or um, whatever it might be. But then like the actual story is a lot more complex than that. There's a lot of immigrants that are just um, families that are trying to come to the United States to um, build a better life for themselves. But because that single story might serve a certain policy agenda, we don't necessarily see the whole story. Um, so like regardless of where you stand on an issue, I think it's really important to look at the bigger picture instead of just subscribing to that single story. Um, okay. And this is kind of the last part of my presentation. We are going to talk about um, how you can use your identity um, and your knowledge of single stories and hopefully like desire to challenge those stories to tell a new story. Um, so while I was in New York City for my journalism class, we wrote a few different pieces. Um, so for the first two of my pieces, I chose to do interviews with young people around my age in stores that sold jewelry and clothing. Um, so my identity as like a 17 year old that is interested in fashion um, and then is also um, living outside of her ethnic community. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, like I mentioned earlier, my parents are Guinean immigrants. So ethnically and um, culturally I am Guinean, but then I'm also um, growing up in Utah. So I'm very much like outside of that community. Um, and then also I am a person that observes a religion with modesty standards. Um, so like I have those different influences that sort of impact the way that I choose to dress on a daily basis. Um, yeah, because obviously like my culture has its cultural garments, but I don't choose to wear those on a regular day. But then um, for sometimes like special occasions I do. Um, and then like also in discussing modesty, um, and current like fashion trends sometimes those are like hard to mesh because um like what is on trend isn't necessarily going to fit with my standards um so taking that all that information about me um and then just like a curiosity about the people in New York City um I chose to first go to a store in a Muslim or like Arab neighborhood um and I met um one of the workers in the store and she was about like 19 or 20 years old and we sort of just had this discussion about Muslim modesty standards um, and then like how um, she is able to still use fashion to express herself while adhering to those modesty standards at the same time. Um, so that was like really interesting for me because obviously like we both observe different um, religions, but then like we have that similarity and then we're also pretty close in age. So I think um, the way that I was able to tell that story um, is really different from the way that someone else, maybe someone that's like a lot older than her that wouldn't be able to um, relate to like, um, I think like youth culture at the moment or someone who doesn't really adhere to a certain like modesty standard might not be able to have that same perspective um, or someone that doesn't necessarily, um, well, I guess like someone that's from like a more Western culture um, might not really um, understand like the appeal of wearing like cultural um, or traditional clothing. So um, we, we were able to connect in those like multiple ways, but then also um, relate to each other despite our differences. Um, and then the second interview I did around this was in a jewelry store, um, which I have like a photo of on this slide. Um, and I talked to another 17 year old in there um, and she is um, ethnically Indian, but she's grown up in New York City. So um, we sort of got to talk about that again, like what it's like to be a second generation American. When do you choose to wear cultural garments and when do you not choose to? Um, yeah, so just like looking at your identity and what you're curious about um, can sort of put you in a really unique position to tell a story um, about someone that you relate to. Um, and then Another piece that I wrote while I was in New York City was an oral history. I'm actually still compiling it, but um, yeah, while I was in New York, the Supreme Court um, 
made a decision on affirmative action. I think, um, I'm not sure what the Supreme Court case was called, but it was about like the University of North Carolina and Harvard University and their admission policies and whether or not they're allowed to consider race in those admission policies. Um, so sort of in like the wake of that Supreme Court decision, um, I was just thinking a lot about like how um, students like me are going to be impacted by that as they're applying for college um, this next application season and in coming years. Um, so thinking about that Supreme Court decision, but then also um, I was in New York City attending this summer program um, and sort of noticing that a lot of the disparities that exist in college admissions um, seemed to be um, prominent in the summer program I was attending as well. So like, um, like the issues in diversity that have been observed in universities, um, I felt were pretty similar um, with the issues in diversity at my summer program. So um, I started like conducting interviews and talking to um, my classmates and my roommates and my teachers and sort of just um, trying to understand like everyone's perspective on the School of the New York Times itself and its admission policy and then like how that relates to the larger issue of diversity in college admissions. So like um, I took like my identity and then also my like current circumstance of being attending that summer program um, and then um, obviously like my status as someone that is about to attend college and just finished the college application process. So like I have this like amalgamation of interests and um, things that I'm curious about, which allowed me to sort of start exploring this one specific story um, that really I feel um, no one else would be able to tell. So um, this is just like an example, but all to say that um, in pretty much any given situation, um, there's going to be like an aspect of your identity um, that I think can connect to like whatever story you feel like is um, unfolding around you. So, um, oh yeah, while I was in New York, we also had um, a guest speaker um, on one of the days. It was Nikita Stewart. She is um, a New York Times writer. She writes on social services. Um, yeah, she's done like some pretty big stories for the New York Times. And um, she told us that the largest obligation in journalism is getting the story right, which like sounds pretty obvious, um, but it also like really stuck with me because um, I think in just like speaking about identity, sometimes being able to relate to the people that you're telling the story about is the only way that you're gonna be able to get the story right. Um, and that's why diversity in journalism is so important. Um, not only do we need to have more diversity in terms of who we're telling the stories about, but also who is telling the stories, um, just because that identity in, um, affects their perspective so deeply. So um, yeah, I guess just something to think about, like your perspective is what is going to help you get the story right. Um, yeah, but I think, yeah, really like my two biggest um, sort of tips or um, what I feel like is essential in diversifying journalism and being able to tell your story is just being able to observe your situation and then also like validate your story. Um, like just like we saw in that um, TED Talk video of Chi Amanda and her sort of feeling like um, because she wasn't represented in literature, she felt like all books had to be about um, the same sort of characters that she was reading about, like the um, American or European characters that drank ginger beer and ate apples, even though that didn't really have anything to do with her, but those were the stories that she felt like were validated. Um, but as we seek to diversify journalism, we're going to have to validate our own stories. Um, and um, I guess I also look for um, ways in which your voice can be affirmed, like when she, Amanda, found authors that were African like her, um, so that she was able to gain, like, a larger perspective on what journalism, or on what literature is, 
Um, and that really like aided in her journey of becoming an author. Um, so yeah, observing stories and then also recognizing that those stories are valid and that they deserve to be told. Um, and yeah, that's what I feel like is like the sort of most important factor is in just being able to diversify journalism using your voice. Um, yeah, that's it from me. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I don't have any questions, but I do have um, a thought about that. If you are watching this and um, you are interested in writing maybe a letter to one of your representatives, or if you're um, if you are interested in writing an opinion piece to a newspaper on issues that matter to you, um, MWAG has our writing lab and you basically go through and, and write your piece. And we have women volunteers that are happy to help you edit that and get it submitted. And that's such a great tool. So if, if you have something that you might want to, to publish um, an opinion piece on, um, I would just, I would just uh, encourage you to use that tool that MWAG has and you can get to it from our website. And I will put a link to that as well. So as Alexa said, we have, you know, we have to get more voices out there to share those diff different perspectives and do those different things. And as I talked about at the beginning, we have our Summer Simply Connect that we've been doing. And this week is um, connect with different ideas and um, connect with different ideas and perspectives. And some of the ideas from the MWAG um, website as we talked about today, some media literacy, um, Alexa talked about looking at things, you know, reading things from different perspectives. Um, so there's some ideas for different ages of kids that you could do on the website. We also, um, it, um, it suggested that you could have a conversation with someone with a different perspective. Maybe somebody, you know, that you know that they, it's, and it's, like telling the story as we talked about today, you go and just ask questions and listen and and find some commonality maybe between you and that person because um, I, I would say that it would be really hard to have a conversation with somebody and not find one thing in common. And when we have those common threads, they connect us to each other. Um, you can also see one of the other suggestions, see how your community um, communicates and what how people put news out and different things and subscribe to those so that you have an idea what's happening in your community, what events are happening. Um, and one of them was uh, look for lectures and discussions or book clubs that because those are great ways to open up and, and hear different opinions. Um, I really love book club and I even if it's just for fiction, it's still interesting to hear people's opinions. Uh, on matters in fiction. So, but find a lecture or something. And then, or also attend an art, music, or dance performance um, that convey different perspectives. And I was thinking summer is a great time because there's a lot of festivals that happen and community events happening while the, while the weather's nice. So attend one of those exhibits or performances and you can even do that online. And if, and that takes me to our next, we have, um, MWAG has been hosting or has been offering our members to host online screenings of a documentary called The Abortion Talks. It is about um, women that came together and have very different perspectives on abortion, but they how they find that common thread. And it is it's a great tie in to this. It is, like I said, it is not about abortion. It is about communicating and um, the humanity of communication and commonality. And so if you are interested in hosting a screening of that in your home, there's still time to register. Our last one will be tomorrow evening. Um, and I can put a link to that in the Facebook discussion group as well. So with that, all that information, there's ways for us to connect um, this summer, this week, um, add those maybe to your goals or just after you watch this, go and find on your community calendar something that you can do or have lunch with a friend, right? And go out and, and just um, 
and 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 talk on different perspectives and be brave. That's that's another thing I think, Alexa. You may have found that I, as I was seeing that you went in and were interviewing things, um, to go and have hear those perspectives and to ask those questions. There comes a little bit. Of, you have to have a little bit of courage, right, to go and ask questions that maybe you're not comfortable with or unfamiliar with cultures or whatever, and think about ways that you can ask them in a really respectful way that shows that you're just there to learn and to hear their story. Um, it's like that single story we were talking about that if, if we really are want to change our own perspectives, we have to, we have to be curious. Um, and, and one last thing that I was thinking about and I wrote this down is that we need to keep adding to our own stories so that when people start asking us about our perspectives, and our experiences, we need to we need to keep having experiences so that we can say, oh, let me tell you what I've tried or what I've experienced that's changed my point of view of the world. And I think that you're doing a great job of that. And you are just on the precipice, really, as you go off to college to have those experiences. And you're going to love it. I promise. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for being um, with us today and doing this presentation. And good luck in school. And I want to thank everybody that's been here today. And we will see you next week. Thank you. Great. Thank you.